Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Friday's plenary session. It's my uh, privilege to formally introduce our co-scientific program chair, Professor Iona Novak, who will then introduce the speaker for our, imp our important basic science lectureship. The basic science lectureship is a cornerstone of the meeting, and uh, we really look forward to this morning's lecture. It's sponsored by McKeith Press, who are the publishers of the Academy's official journal, the Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. So Professor Iona Novak is the head of research at Cerebral Palsy Alliance, University of Notre Dame, Australia. Iona is a Fulbright Scholar establishing Accelerate, an American-Australian cerebral palsy stem cell research consortium. And she's putting a lot of energy into this, and I think it will really create some interesting progress in the field. Driven by an internal belief that research in healthcare has the potential to change lives, Iona has pursued projects and roles with the greatest possible impact. So she's a very strategic thinker, and uh, she chooses uh, what she focuses on very wisely. So, Professor Iona Novak, thank you. Are you having a good time? Yeah. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you this morning one of the giants of pediatric neurology, Professor Donna Ferrero. She is uh, the chair of the Department of Pediatrics and the physician in chief at UCSF at the Minoff Children's Hospital. She's also the co director of the Newborn Brain Research Institute. There are just so many things to like about Donna's work. Her basic science is impeccable. Her ability to translate work right to the bedside, and I've had the privilege of working at her unit, and I have never seen 30 physicians around a baby with their iPads out reading articles whilst they're making treatment decisions. It is a wonderful, wonderful unit. Uh, she has enormous leadership skills. She has the capacity to choose projects and make decisions that really change our field. And probably, the, 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 much to my amusement when I got there, I knew there were so many things I liked about her. Uh, the staff said to me, who do you know here? And I said, oh, I know Donna Ferreira. And they said, oh, you're going to do very well. And then there was this little awkward silence, and everyone looked at the floor. And then they said, we know why you like Donna. And I said, why is that? You like shoes. So <laughs> we have a lot of things in common, but we also like good shoes. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Ferreira this morning. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Iona, and thank you, Darcy, and to the organizing committee and to the academy for allowing a child neurologist to come speak to you about her work. Uh, I'm absolutely honored to be here, and Iona's right. It was she was with us uh, a few months, and it was uh, 30 to 40 pairs of wonderful shoes that brightened every day when she was there. Um, well. Let me uh, tell you that what I'd like to do in the next 40 minutes is spend some time talking about just highlighting some of the neuroprotective strategies, talking about a little bit about the work we've done, and then showing you how we could potentially follow whether this uh, approach to strategies actually makes sense in the developing brain. And most importantly, I want to end up where my heart is, and that is back in the uh, nursery to show you how the um, neonatal nursery works at UCSF uh, that Iona was uh, speaking about a little while ago. So I do not have anything to disclose. When I talk about uh, drugs, there, it's all published data that I'll be giving you. So uh, obviously, I don't have to convince this audience that 
the, this problem is huge, but it, it always amazes me that when I give a talk that people forget that neonatal stroke in particular is more common than stroke in the elderly. Over, it, and this is an underrepresentation because we diagnose stroke often with MRI and maybe sometimes not until much later when the child presents with a hemiparesis. The, the uh, magnitude of neonatal encephalopathy is huge worldwide, and we still are trying to understand the causes of neonatal encephalopathy. And then, of course, we have this huge problem with preterm birth globally, and at least in the United States, we're faced with one in eight deliveries being preterm, which results in over half of those kids being cognitively impaired as well as motorically impaired. So I want to show you that there's hope. There is a window of opportunity to provide therapies if we can make an accurate diagnosis initially. So let me show you this. I only have this one laser pointer, so please uh, look at this screen here as I go through this. This is a term baby who had a middle cerebral artery stroke, difficult traumatic delivery, large for gestational age with a skull fracture. And we did a number, this is McKinstry's data from WashU, and you can see that if you do a number of different studies, you can see a little bit of diffusion restriction on this image, that little black dot there. You can see it a little bit on the T1. You don't see anything on the T2, and the flare is just starting to show. But look what happens three days later. That's blossoming into a huge area on the diffusion. We still don't see very much on the T2. By eight days, this scan undergoes pseudo, what's called pseudo-normalization, so the Diffusion restriction becomes diffusion enhancement, so we have to now look for a bright signal, but it's much better seen on the flare. Look at the progression of that injury over time. That's a week. That's only a week, and it's continuing. And we sit there, and we still don't know what we should be doing exactly to prevent that from evolving. We do, do know a little bit about mechanisms for some of the problems that cause acquired neonatal brain injury, and most of them happen before we even have a chance to intervene, and that's oxidative stress and excitotoxicity. The important features that we can modify are inflammation and cell death, because they occur from hours to days to weeks in time. And inflammation goes from being bad to good, so we have to learn how to manipulate the brain environment so that we can turn those bad microglia, for example, into good ones. And some cells should die. We don't want cells that sprout abnormally and make bad connections to remain. We want to get rid of them. But most importantly, we want repair. But look, repair isn't happening right away. The brain first has to clean house after an injury, and then it can repair itself. So we need to focus on days, if not weeks, for our repair therapies. So let's go over a few ways how we can protect the newborn brain. Most of you have heard about hypothermia, so I'd like to go over the current data on that, talk a little bit about drugs, and a little bit about diet. And I'm only going to give a few examples because we'd be here all day if I went through an exhaustive list. So therapeutic hypothermia is still a bit of a problem because we don't know who we want to treat. It's based on the recognition of neonatal encephalopathy in the nursery, but sometimes that's really hard to pick up. If you have a baby who's a little hyper alert, is that baby just hyper alert? Or is that baby evolving into a bad neonatal encephalopathy? 
We try to use adjunctive measures like the EEG to look at brain function, but according to current protocols, we have six hours to make this decision and get that baby cooled for 72 hours. It doesn't look like we should treat them later. There are some ongoing studies, but the uh, analyses are being stopped because starting later, starting going deeper, doesn't seem to increase efficacy. And the other thing is, who should be excluded? If we have a baby with Down syndrome, we don't usually treat babies who have, quote, congenital malformations or genetic defects. But that baby with Down syndrome already has a challenge, and if that baby does experience some kind of asphyxial insult, shouldn't that baby be treated? At our institution, we do that. We treat any baby with neonatal encephalopathy. There have been five very large randomized clinical trials of hypothermia with both 18 to 24 month and six to seven year follow-up. The cool cap, that was the head cooling trial, um, the NICHD trial, Toby trial, the ICE trial from Australia, and the European Neuro Network trial. And the good news is that first, we didn't survive a bunch of babies with profound defects because that was the biggest concern, that we would save the baby but not the brain. Uh, but that hasn't happened. We haven't shifted toward more severe disabilities. And it does look like major neurodevelopmental outcomes are, are favored by treatment with hypothermia. And it really doesn't matter whether you use the cool cap or whole body cooling. We, we've switched to whole body because we like to measure brain activity with EEG and amplitude integrated EEG. So uh, you can't do that with a cool cap. But you can see whether it's head or whole body, all of the studies are, are favoring hypothermia. So that's the good news. At UCS, and the number needed to treat is seven, which is absolutely terrific. It doesn't fix everything, though, so we have to keep pushing on this. We have to figure out what's next and who gets it, because not all babies need additional treatment, but certainly some do, and we still haven't figured out what the metabolic perturbations are or biomarkers are that tell us who needs more therapy. If you look at the long-term outcomes, uh, the TOBY trial, that's the UK trial, had a number needed to treat of eight with good outcomes uh, seen at six to seven years. And they have some nice MR data that they've published as well. The cool cap only did an interview using the WeFIM instrument at six years. But the good news was what they saw at 18 months uh, remained true at six to seven years. So as we're following these babies, they're not getting worse. They're not falling off. Because often, we know, our kids grow into their deficits. The NICHD trial wasn't statistically significant, but I think we can say that there is a clinical significance in the reduction of uh, reduced mortality and severe disability. At UCSF, we rely heavily on MRI, and uh, we've uh, reported, this is Son Sonia Bonifacio's data that she reported a couple of years ago, and i just like to point out that the deep gray nuclei, uh, which, when abnormal, are harbingers for severe neurodevelopmental disability, was reduced in the hypothermia children. These are small numbers but they've held up over time. The, um, and the appearance of normal scans seem to be uh, more prevalent in the cool babies. So all very encouraging, uh, but still uh, not the whole answer. So what can we do before the baby's even born? Uh, mag I highlight magnesium because it seems to be a good drug. It has a reason to be a good drug. 
I mentioned earlier about excitotoxicity. Excitotoxicity is governed by glutamate receptors, specifically, and in particular, the N-methyl D-aspartate receptor. And that receptor is blocked by magnesium. So there's actually a mechanistic reason why this, might, this drug might work. At least in this study, we've seen um, uh, that uh, giving the mom uh, magnesium sulfate compared to saline did improve uh, um, gross motor dysfunction and combined death or substantial gross motor dysfunction. However, there were no significant differences in mortality or CP in the survivors. The BEAM trial, which was done in the US, um, was encouraging but not perfect. Magnesium did not reduce the risk of the composite outcome of CP and death, but it did, was seen to reduce CP in, as well as moderate to severe CP without increasing the risk of death. But the number to treat is quite high, 56. So we don't really know what happens if you give magnesium and then you cool. I don't think anybody's looked at that data, but that's something we need to do. Melatonin's an interesting drug. It's over the counter. Many of us use it for our kids who have sleeping problems. I use it when I go to Australia, uh, protect my brain at the same time. Uh, some, of, some people have uh, observed that melatonin seems to be low in very fragile newborns, IUGR, small for gestational age, and PREMS. And Valerie, Valerie Baron at INSARM in Paris measured uh, melatonin in the PREMS and did indeed find out that these babies are melatonin deficient. And they now have a trial supplementing these babies with melatonin. So it'll be interesting to hear the results of that trial forthcoming. There's also a melatonin IUGR study listed on clinicaltrials.gov. It says when you go online that they're still recruiting, but it hadn't been updated since 2012, so I'm not quite sure of the status of this study but a composite neonatal outcome uh, will be uh, measured. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if melatonin given during pregnancy will help outcome. There are a couple of favorites. Uh, pomegranate juice actually is rich in polyphenols and does great things. The, these are data from Dave Holtzman's lab at WashU. Uh, he fed pregnant rats pomegranate juice, and uh, then when the babies were born seven days later, subjected them to an hypoxic ischemic insult, and the pomegranate drinking moms, their babies did much better. And then another fellow in his lab decided to just give the uh, drug if you will, the polyphenol after uh, the insult, not to the mom, not to the uh, pregnant uh, mom or the pup uh, before the insult, but after the insult. And I think you can see here that there is a reduction uh, in all of the areas of the brain favoring uh, treatment. So interesting and maybe worth uh, thinking about a big trial for this. There are uh, data on omega-3s. This is the animal data I'm showing you. There are human data too, I believe, from uh, Adelaide. Uh, the omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid supplementation to the mom reduced brain damage in the baby pups. And there are the pictures that show what happens if you give hypoxia ischemia and then if you treat the animal? And another study looked even five weeks after the injury. Remember I said you, this thing is evolving over a long period of time. And even that much later, there is um, 
first of all, continued activation of inflammatory mediators, and then a persistence of protection with uh, reduced tissue loss in those animals. So another potential safe therapy if we choose to explore this further. I've spent a lot of time looking at erythropoietin in the lab. We've looked at it both in the setting of pure hypoxia ischemia in rats and mice, and we've looked at it in rats uh, where we've created a stroke, which is really my uh, major interest. Uh, through expert hands, not my own, uh, a siliconized suture is inserted into the common carotid, up the internal carotid, and sits at the bifurcation of the middle cerebral artery for 90 minutes. We pull the suture and do an MRI scan, and the pups that have abnormal signal get randomized to treatment with erythropoietin or not. Initially, we were only giving one dose, and it looked favorable at two weeks, but by three months, we had lost any effect at all. So we decided to give multiple doses, and a dose as late as a week later. Remember, I showed you on that graph that this injury is evolving, and if the one thing I can leave you with is that timing is critical and treatment should continue. And indeed, when we did that, we saw a marked improvement in the animals who were treated at, with three doses. And when you compared them with the sham animals, both on behavior tests, this is a swimming test that uh, measures uh, cognitive ability, if you will, in the animal's uh, memory. So we saw improvement in function here they look just like the shams and improvement in structure, but not complete, which is also an important point because do you have to fill the hole in order to get recovery? We don't think so. We think the brain has enormous potential to recover, does not have to heal the whole scar, but it does have to connect. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about connectivity in a minute. One of the reasons why we think erythropoietin is important is because it nudges stem cells to behave properly. So in the setting of injury, we want those cells that are being pumped out of those germinal zones, like the subventricular zone, to turn into neurons, to turn into oligodendrocytes, and not turn into astrocytes, which are the scar tissues that we have. And indeed, when uh, Fernando Gonzalez in our group injected animals first uh, right after birth with a marker, GFP, which marks the cells, they take this up and turn green, uh, and then did the insult, treated with EPO, and then sacrificed them 10 and 17 and 21 days later and stained for newly migrating neurons, he found, much to his delight, that the animals treated with EPO, the stroke animals, had many more newly migrating double cordon positive cells, both right after the insult, and it was sustained even at uh, P21, which is essentially adolescence for these animals, uh, compared to what happened to vehicle-treated animals who had very little cells at all. So this happens normally, right? So here's an EPO-treated, non-injured animal. So endogenous EPO does this anyway. So if we can just nudge the endogenous system, we might end up helping repair. And indeed, there are a number of studies. Um, this is EPO for neuroprotection phase one study looking at safety and pharmacokinetics uh, by, run by Yvonne Wu. Uh, and uh, she was delighted to see that th this EPO was given to babies who were treated with hypothermic who had neonatal encephalopathy, 
and it was well tolerated. The dose mimicked that which we were using in the animals. There is favorable follow-up data, and I'd like to draw your attention to Liz Rogers' talk in the epidemiology section. I believe it's at 11.07, so I'm not going to tell you her punchline. Uh, but there were no deaths uh, initially, and the head MRIs favored, like they did with just hypothermia alone, favored normal versus uh, basal ganglia injury. So we have extensive preclinical support for EPO, and now there's even primate data from Sunny Jewel. I removed that uh, slide just to, uh, in the interest of time, but she shows some good results with her monkeys. Small human trials are suggestive of benefit. The dose is appropriate, seems to be safe. And there are ongoing studies. Yvonne is now doing a phase two trial and hopefully will get funded for a phase three trial in, in the near future. Very good news out of Utrecht, Linda DeVries and Manal Benders used EPO for stroke. So the important thing here is that the EPO was given after they figured out the baby had the stroke, okay? So it's an issue of timing again. The baby could have been one day old, three days old, four days old, but they gave it anyway, and they gave it 24 and 48 hours later. They gave multiple doses, and so far, no adverse effects on any hematological functions. It was well tolerated. And Linda is feeling so positive about the uh, emerging results that she's having difficulty randomizing her babies. So what about this concept of giving a drug and hypothermia? So we're, Yvonne's done it with uh, EPO, um, and others have also done it. And we can do it in a variety of uh, bullets. And here's one that was done kind of serendipitously. In this neo-neuro trial that I talked about a little er earlier, um, George Simbruner uh, actually looked at the data of hypothermia in his cohort but realized that there was a subgroup of kids who got morphine to reduce shivering, which uh, we give to these babies, and found that the babies who had morphine plus hypothermia did better than the babies with hypothermia alone. So this was kind of a serendipitous finding that suggests that there's um, room to explore this further. Nikki Robertson in the UK has taken that drug melatonin that I told you about and uh, coupled it with hypothermia in piglets. And she's shown that a hypothermia plus melatonin improves function as measured by amplitude integrated EEG, reduces oxidative stress as measured by spectroscopy, the lactate 10AA ratio, and reduces cell death in a number of regions, and most specifically the deep gray nuclei by measuring cleave caspase three. Mariana Thorison's looking at xenon. Xenon's interesting, it's a noble gas. It's quite expensive, but people have found a way to recycle it to keep the cost down. But it could be given to the mother as an anesthetic for delivery or it could be given to the baby. The trials that are ongoing right now are, are being uh, utilized only in the babies, not the mothers yet. But this is um, Mariana's rat data, and there's piglet data, and now emerging human data. And whether you give the xenon right away or you wait a couple of hours, they still see benefit. So again, Waiting is not a bad thing, and we don't have to rush to therapy in all situations. So if you look on clintrials.gov, you'll see a plethora of studies, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I 
direct you to that website if you're interested to see. And they range from everything from what I've told you about, some of the treating the mom, treating the child, drugs, drugs plus hypothermia, and stem cells. Stem cells are uh, uh, quite interesting and quite controversial and quite unproven, and I'm looking forward to Iona's uh, work in this regard. But I want to tell you a little bit why we think stem cells might work. Not because you give the cells and they engraft and fill up the brain and change the structure, but because they are actual little factories of growth factors that, like EPO, that can switch cell fate and improve brain repair. We've used a neonatal stroke model. We've given mesenchymal stem cells from umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells intranasally, so a nice approach, very uh, non-invasive. We did not see engraftment, but we saw improvement. And we think the reason why we're seeing improvement is because of all these little growth factors that are pushing these progenitor cells into proper function, functional cells that will enhance neurogenesis, gliogenesis, et cetera. So that's all well and good. We have lots of pipe dreams, and I've spent better than 25 years dreaming about curing these things. But how do we know what we're doing is actually doing it? And this is where I think MRI has really exploded our field, as well as kept us honest, because we can now actually monitor what happens. And as I mentioned before, we're not so interested in plugging the hole or filling up that hole, but in really seeing how the brain connects. So we know on a microscopic scale, we want the neurons to communicate via axonal projections. And we can actually use diffusion-weighted MRI to look at all of those connections. We can use tractography, but we can also use other methods that tell us about the connectome. And the connectome is two big concepts. One is looking at modules or clusters of activity using MRI, and that's called segregation. And we want that to increase with age. We want lots of active modules occurring in the brain, and we also want them to integrate. So we want to make sure that the path is there and that the path is short. And I'm gonna show you preliminary data here that shows you if you look at kids who have had neonatal encephalopathy, as their neuromotor score increases badly, so one, zero is normal, five is spastic quad, they form fewer modules and their path length, the integration, is worse as their motor capabilities are worse. So that tells us that the motor capabilities are just a sign of all those other things, because these modules are also measuring all kinds of measures of cognition, sensory processing, et cetera. So we can now use anatomic MRI images to look at structure but not be so worried when we hold up that image and show the parents this is the area of infarction. We don't have to say, oh dear, that's a big infarct, so I'm afraid your child's going to be damaged, because it's not true. Because at the same time, that brain is trying to improve connectivity and tracks, and we can look at that with tractography. And then we can look at the actual networks, the functionality of the brain using diffusion MRI over time. And these are just some of the images that our fantastic physicists have achieved from PREMS, term babies, 
six-month-olds and adults. And the te techniques keep improving. We're now using spectroscopy to look at uh, different ways the brain metabolizes uh, compounds and goes through its energy processes. And hopefully using the metabolome in the brain, we could image the baby after cooling, the hope is, and say, okay, this metabolome isn't good, so let's give that baby additional treatment. Whereas this metabolome looks fine, let's get this baby to mom and dad. And we're doing those studies right now in rats and mice, and hopefully we'll have that information for humans shortly. And finally, I wanna bring it back to the clinic because all of this science and information about mechanisms is meaningless if we can't execute on it clinically. And you all know that because that's what you do. So we want to improve outcomes for babies at risk of neurological injury because we want to identify them early and provide appropriate treatment over time, not just those few hours or days after birth. And we've done this by creating a neurointensive care nursery. This took a lot of work from a lot of dedicated people. It involves neurology, neuroradiology, neonatology, nursing support, which is 100% critical, therapists, occupational, developmental specialists, physical therapists, and thinking about the research while we're communicating with each other. And this is, I wanna tell you how we do it a little bit. This is our Nikon in action. Here's Luke on a cooling blanket. Um, Luke is now um, quite a few years old and doing very well, thank thankfully. But you can see the enormous amount of machinery that it takes to keep that baby cool and to monitor that baby properly and we use amplitude integrated EEG and video EEG to do that. This focus on a co-management model is critical and it starts with nursing. We have specialized nurses and I can tell you Sue Peliquin in our nursery, if it weren't for her, we wouldn't have this program at all. We've trained nurses who are quite competent in rapid triage, in clinical assessment, applying the cooling blanket and dealing with all that machinery, but importantly, in putting on the AEG and being able to interpret it and calling the neonatologist and the neurologist and saying, this baby's not doing well. I think we better look at the full montage. So it's ongoing education. Neonatology is critical. Our neonatologists are the ones who stabilize the patient, pay careful attention to the physiology, and provide all that advanced life support that these fragile babies need. And the neurologists come in. We like to talk about mechanisms of entry and differential diagnosis, but we actually do do some things. We examine the babies. We try. <laughs> and we interpret EEG. Importantly, we manage seizures and we do it quickly because we think seizures are bad for the developing brain. And we do try to provide prognosis in the family setting with the whole team. Co-management involves daily rounds. We meet every morning at 9.30. We go around this huge entourage of people that includes the neurologists, neonatologists, the residents, the fellows, the nurses, the bedside nurses, and other trainees. And we make decisions together. And those decisions are based on protocols that we've developed over time that have been agreed upon by everybody. So that if I'm on the attending on service and I go up there I can't use my little 
cocktail of drugs that I want to use for neonatal seizures. We have a standardized approach that everybody uses uniformly, which allows us to measure how well we're doing in this treatment. So I hope that I've shown you that there are many ways to provide neuroprotection. And perhaps the best way is actually the easiest way, and that is to provide brain-focused care for babies at risk, to provide developmentally appropriate care for babies at risk, and to not stop thinking about them once they leave the nursery. I think our best strategies are probably going to be multiply armed. There is no single magic bullet. And I believe that MR will keep us honest in figuring out which ones are the best. So I look forward to the 21st century of improvement in care of the neurologically challenged newborn. I thank you for your attention.